the important point, what is the nature of the problem? We need to talk about it now. Otherwise, solutions will not follow. I think an example of, of, of when that didn't happen was um, the uh, Deepwater Horizon oil spill. That did not get framed as, okay, what are we doing going miles beneath the surface of the sea ocean to get oil? What are we doing? It's obviously, we're, we're, we're getting more and more risky in our pursuit of fossil fuels. Maybe we should rethink fossil fuels. But instead, it was framed as we got to get people back to work as fast as possible. So Gulf communities need to be able to go shrimping. Is the environment polluted? Is the shrimp polluted? Let's push that one aside for now. We got to get people back to work. And once you frame it that way, the answer follows. Open the economy. That was the answer. No, no attention to, okay, what are we doing on a macro scale with fossil fuels? And what did we just do to the Gulf of Mexico? There are communities, particularly on the southern end of the Gulf of Mexico, that are still dealing with the ramifications. And they're being told, no, the water is clean. And they're, they're pulling fish in, in, out of the water. And it's, it's not. This radio program and podcast is called The Conversation Lab. My name is Don Schaefer, and today we're speaking with Andrew Hoffman. So uh, what haven't we talked about that we should? Well, something hopeful. I think that this is a great opportunity. Change happens in crisis, and we're in a crisis. So now it's incumbent on people that see the need for change and understand what it is to step forward and articulate and take, you know, take steps to make that happen. You know, the idea that change happens in a crisis, I can give you all the social science you want that says that. Thomas Kuhn wrote it most famously in his book on the structure of scientific revolutions, or you can just get colloquial about it when Rahm Emanuel said you never waste a good crisis. Change happens, so we're in it. Okay, what are we going to change, and how are we going to change it? Don't just assume it's going to happen. You have to take action to make it happen. Take advantage of this opportunity to try and drive change. That's the key. And you see it, you know, that that experiment in New York City. See, Brussels is opening up. Downtown is a pedestrian mall. Milan is opening up. They have a very low uh, speed limit to discourage cars from coming into the city. I believe it's like 20 kilometers an hour. What's going to change? That's, uh, you know, can we have a more of a local economy? Can we, uh, how many people are looking at all the stuff they have and saying, this isn't what matters? How many people are in a house that's too big for them and suddenly realize, holy smokes, I'm having trouble making that mortgage payment? bigger, more, you know, life is not about more stuff. That sounds so trite. In a crisis like this, I have to imagine some people are coming to that realization. Now make it stick. It's stickiness. It's all about stickiness. Anyone who's not doing any kind of self-examination right now is not paying attention. Do you think that's possible? I don't know. I don't know. A friend of mine said this to me yesterday in a different way. He said, anyone who's not slightly depressed right now is not paying attention. But you do have people saying, you know, <laughs> the iconic image, I don't know if you saw it, but a woman holding up a sign saying, give me liberty or give me death. Patrick Henry's famous line. Mm-hmm. From and she was standing on the front steps of a Baskin Robbins. And I'm just thinking, Patrick Henry is rolling in his grave. It's like, <laughs> no, that's not what I was talking about. Some people are framing this as something the governor has done to them, not as a pandemic. I saw the same thing one time I went to California when they're having some major droughts and I was in the central Valley and um, under federal law, you can't drain a river dry. You, 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 there's animals that live there. So you can't drain it dry, but you can draw it down pretty far, but you can't drain it dry. So the rivers were still flowing while the almond fields, which are an absurdly water intensive crop, uh, were going dry. And farmers said, this is a manufactured crisis by the federal government. And it's like, no, it's not. And so there are some people who will not see this for what it is because all they're seeing is something that the government is doing to them. Well, hopefully there's more of us and fewer of them. I'm, yeah. I'm, I wonder about that sometimes. But Well, the, the survey shows that, that more people are cautious about opening back up right now. But then you can have some crazy talk like the governor of Texas, who said that uh, there are senior citizens who would be willing to risk their lives to get the economy going again. Really? I mean, and there's where business logic can start to get you into trouble. Yeah. If if the whole purpose of existence is to make money and keep the economy going, if we are consumers and full stop, then yeah, that would make sense. Sacrifice your life for the ultimate purpose, which is moving money. I personally don't believe that's the purpose of life, but you know, people do need to make money. This is the, this is the the conundrum, but there has to be a third way. How do we stay safe and keep food on the table? How do we do that? Are there any countries out there that you admire or are looking at carefully to see how they navigate 
Well, everyone's pointing at New Zealand as an mm-hmm. example. They clamped down really fast. There was an interesting comment uh, in the New York Times. There was a story about this and different countries' responses. And I enjoy the comment section. I find I learn as much from the comment section as the story. And someone wrote in and said, look, the reason Germany got on this so well is that in Germany, people trust the government. If the government says stay inside for your own good, we trust that it's probably for our own good and we stay inside. And in America, we don't trust the government. So if they stay inside, we think they're trying to do something to us. So we go outside. <laughs> and, and so those are cultural differences that, that, that are highlighted by this that are quite fascinating. But it was an interesting article saying that if you look at some of the countries that have been most adept at responding to this, the number of them that have women as leaders is disproportionately high. New Zealand, Germany. Yeah. Uh, you know, Angela, Angela Merkel is a, a former scientist, so she understands this. And she's come out and said, folks, this is not over by a long shot. And so we have to think the long haul here. She's she's one of the few that gets it. Anything else keep you up at night? You know, it just it, it's a, it's inter- it's amazing what we can do with social media to get through this. This is this is um. It's not the same thing as a hug. No, it's not. And uh, the social elements of this are challenging. And something else I think about my graduate students in their late twenties, early thirties. I've had three formative experiences in my life. They've had the same three, and their life is much shorter. Yeah. 9-11, the Great Recession, and COVID. So for them, certainty doesn't exist. It doesn't. Your world can change overnight. Um, individual actions matter. Their, their conception of reality, just like when we talk about the generation that grew up through the Depression and never wasting anything. You know, my grandmother just saved everything. You know, that waste not, want not. How is this generation being formed by these events is a very interesting question and worth studying. How will, that will be a big driver of the change of our culture is, is these young people. The world they see is not the same as the world you and I see. It's fundamentally different for from those incredible events that have happened. Are they having different conversations than, than we're having? I, I have to believe yes. It'd be, it'd be interesting to explore that more. What do they see? What do they hear? Um, I can tell you that generation, they don't want to own a car. You talk about moving mm-hmm. away from materialism. I, I, I got a, a license the day I could. I got a car the day I could. I love cars. I think they're beautiful. My students think I'm crazy. And they are questioning capitalism. Surveys show that young people are becoming more suspicious of capitalism. Let's hope they turn that suspicion into positive change to say, okay, let's, let's change it. That's what, you know, why people were behind Bernie. He was going to, and that's why I personally think that the, the Trump voter and the Bernie voter, voter are the same in the, to the extent prior to Trump's presidency. Both dissatisfied with the status quo. Something needs to change. We need radical shift. And both of them promised to give it. We tried one. Um, I don't know. History will never know. But I was. I would. I would wonder if it became a, a, an election between Bernie and Trump. Those that want change would say, "Okay, you gave. We gave you a try. Didn't work. We're going to give this guy a try." Voters would just would have moved on mass from one side to the other and say, "Okay, now it's your turn. Fix it." But my hope is that uh, Bernie changed the Democratic Party enough that they recognize the nature of the problem, and will work to address it. Well, it's good to see your face. It's good to nice, see your Nice picture. to catch up. Nice to, uh, you know, I, I throw most of my questions away because we've kind of <laughs> broached you, them. You know, there's a quote. It's been attributed to Winston Churchill, and I haven't been able to verify that, but it's still a great quote. He says, if you're not offending anyone, you never took a stand. If you're saying something important, you know, say it and take the consequences. But to play it safe, you're not saying anything important. I, uh, again, really want to thank you for your time, and uh, I know you're busy. Uh, what's, what's school look like for you for the fall? We don't know. It's a big question mark and a, a disconcerting one because I do not want to go online. I just I don't know how you teach online. Um, this is not online education. This is, you know, if I just stand in front of a camera and try and teach, I'm teaching in person through a camera. I'm not this... Online means something totally different. It's yeah. taking, you have to redo it from the, the ground up. You can't just patch on the existing system. And I think if we're not careful, we're going to sour a generation on online education. Uh, Andy, listen, I really want to thank you for catching Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Well, and we'll a lot of fun. Good to see you. We can do this when we're not recording, too.
that'd be great. We've been speaking with Andy Hoffman. You can find his books and articles online under Andrew J. Hoffman. His email, of course, is at the University of Michigan, and you can find more about him on our website at theconversationlab.ca. That's another edition of The Conversation Lab. This radio program and podcast is produced by CFRO-FM in Vancouver's downtown east side on the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil Nations. Our gratitude and thanks to them, as well as the many not-for-profit organizations and community groups for their support. If you enjoyed this program, please consider becoming a member of Co-op Radio to help support programs like these. If you know anyone or an organization with a story to share, please let them know about us. We can be found at Co-op radio.org, theconversationlab.ca, and on many social media and podcasting platforms. Kim at Sakon, John Massacar, and Julian Anton have helped produce this program. Thanks, guys, and thank you for dropping by the Conversation Lab. <laughs>